Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. to episode 101 of the terrible book club i'm paris and this is chris hi there this time we read hounded the iron druid chronicles book one by kevin hearn at the request of our patron luchek j again this was published in 2011 by uh Ballantine del rey which are uh imprints of random house if this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, though, like today, we also read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. In general, though, we do the opposite of what most people do at a bookstore or while they're browsing online looking for something to read. Um, and usually this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while we end up liking the book. Uh, content warnings today. So aside from our typical barnyard language, we've got some non-graphic sex, uh, magic, and violence of the generally medieval variety. So we're talking like sword fighting. Um, just a reminder, this is the last episode of season five of the Terrible Book Club. Thank you for joining us this year. We, uh, we will. You're, you're not going to notice that we're taking a break, but Chris and I are taking a break and we're pretty stoked about it. So yeah, woo. it's the beginning of a marathon recording session where we're doing... A couple episodes, some other things on the side. Yeah, we're um, doing another Freaky Antiques recording uh, later and some Patreon content. And uh, yeah, we're doing we're doing like a six hours of recording. Today, so. Yeah, I'm trying not to look at this as six hours of TBC work and more as six hours of hanging out with my friend. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Six hours of hanging out with friends. Uh, luckily for you, though, this recording itself is not six hours. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, the summary for Hounded, the Iron Druid Chronicles, book one, is thus. Atticus O'Sullivan, last of the druids, lives peacefully in Arizona, running an occult bookshop and shape-shifting in his spare time to hunt with his Irish wolfhound. His neighbors and customers think that this handsome, tattooed Irish dude is about 21 years old, when in actuality, he's 21 centuries old. Not to mention, he draws his power from the earth, Possesses a sharp wit and wields an even sharper magical sword known as Fragarok, the Answerer. Unfortunately, a very angry Celtic god wants that sword, and he's hounded Atticus for centuries. Now, the determined deity has tracked him down, and Atticus will need all his power. Plus the help of a seductive goddess of death, his vampire and werewolf team of attorneys, a bartender possessed by a Hindu witch, and some good old-fashioned luck of the Irish to kick some Celtic arse and deliver himself from evil. Oh boy, uh, so if you've listened to our Monster Hunters International episode, this is along those lines, I think. Uh, a lot of fun action. Um, Chris, what was your your initial, uh, uh, sorry, your initial like tagline for this book? Oh, it's, it's an Irish anime. Yeah, Irish, Irish anime. That's a great <laughs> way to put it. It's it's got all the elements of anime that you need. A too cool for school main protagonist who looks young but is secretly millennia old has great powers that, you know, he can throw around pretty much at will. Um unnecessary horny levels, another key part of this. <laughs> yes, very key. Um, um it, that's the general components I would say of like a really bad shonen anime. Yeah, and I th and I'm glad that you know I'm glad we do this show together because I as a person who is not has never read an anime I would never have read an anime. Paris, you is don't that... read anime. Yeah, yeah. No, you read the manga. <laughs> Can How you dare tell? you? I have never read an anime, kids. Uh... 
Jesus Christ. Uh, man, I'm I'm actually I'm only 31. I'm not that Hundreds old. of weebs <laughs> just screeched in horror. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm actually 31 centuries old. That's the problem. I'm too old oh, yeah, to understand the modern the modern kids and their anime is. I have never I have no, I have never read a manga which I have come to believe is a printed anime. <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> and um I, several hundred more screeches yeah i uh i so i have watched a few anime films but um there's only been you know i've only liked a few of them i'm not really into your typical what sh shonen is that what you're you're saying sorry that's your type of anime that's usually aimed at a young adult male that's usually very power fantasy based lots of fighting yeah. And I am more powerful than you. No, but I have trained to be even more powerful than you. Yeah, not really Let us my fight. jam. Not really my jam. So that's kind of what we've got here. Although I will say, I definitely prefer this sort of setting and cast of characters since I'm not really into Japanese stuff, I guess. Irish stuff seems a little more appealing to me, marginally. Um, and maybe that's maybe that was the idea. Uh, anyway, we've got our... Oh, man. Hey, if you thought me butchering Welsh Gaelic was bad, welcome to me butchering Irish. <laughs> I will even say uh, another facet common in a lot of animes is, is just stealing words and names from like other mythologies and using them as your character names. Mm. Like there is this I, I did a Google for Celtic anime after this just to see if there was anything. <laughs> And uh, there actually kind of isn't, except, like, you know, you'll see the names used a lot. Like, there's a lot of doula hands out there in yeah. animes. I saw one anime that was called, like, The Magus's Wife or something that involved a character named Oberon. And there was oh, some hey. other fae stuff kind of in there. It was about a 15-year-old Japanese girl who gets wed to an ancient Magus. So, like, there's questionable stuff to be had there oh well. yeah that sounds real bad god at least we didn't have uh -huh. any underage weird shit happening in here anyway let's talk uh chris do you want to take us through our cast characters or would you rather me tackle the irish oh, i'm scared of these names okay so I, go I got it i got it um so i'll do the polish stuff later <laughs> oh yeah that's true we want how do we keep finding books with like norse and polish things for both of us to try to pronounce it's just really weird it just keeps happening oh yeah because most people that create things and get published are white so oh. <laughs> mystery solved oh yeah that mystery solved uh, anyway <laughs> so our uh, our too cool for you main character guy uh he goes by atticus o'sullivan now but his real name is shihan o'sullivan I think I'm saying that right. I think I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm getting the last. There is the pronunciation right. guide at the front of the book, which was helpful to me. So I, I actually guess like. Yeah, I actually love the pronunciation pronunciation guide. I thought that was great, and it's missing from a lot of books. Um, Angus Og is uh, the uh, Atticus or Shihan, whatever he goes by Atticus in the book. It's Atticus is a uh, arch nemesis. Angus Og is like a love god, apparently. Um, the Morrigan. I don't know that there's a better way to pronounce that. Uh, Flidish, the or Flidis, uh, however you want to say her name. She's a sort of uh, milking cattle goddess, also sometimes interpreted as a goddess of the hunt, although that is debated in scholarship. But in, you know, according to my, my brief foray into reading about this shit, uh, she's important. Uh, the best dog, Oberon the Irish Wolfhound. Can we just get a... Just a just a little clap for Oberon. Good dog. Good dog. Best character. Uh, Grania Weil, uh, she is a bartender who is possessed by Laksha, oh, a uh, witch from India how many thousands of years ago? I forget. Maybe a thousand years ago. A while. Yeah. And then Radomila, I think, Chris, yes, help me with job. that. Uh, who is a Polish witch, and then her coven, there's Emilia, Malina, and all the other ones Chris will pronounce much better than I will, than, that have more complicated Zs and Ks smashed together in their names. Um, there's also a host, in addition to like the, the Polish coven, there's also a host of, <sighs> yes, once again, vampire Viking werewolves. Can you fucking believe it? I couldn't. Okay, to be, clear, to be clear, there are a bunch of lawyers some of which are werewolves, and one of which is a vampire? And all of which are Vikings. Yes. Why do all Norse people have to be Viking? 
Can't they just be a, a Nordic vampire and that's it? Yeah, it's very weird that it's like, oh, you're from Iceland or Norway? Oh, you got to be a, or Dan or Denmark? Oh, you got to be a Viking. It's the only thing you could be. It's like, why couldn't you just have not been that? Like, the Viking period is such a short period of time. <laughs> In fact, they didn't even do anything Viking-like. They were only just doing werewolf stuff or vampire stuff. Yeah. So I don't know why I didn't that... see one thing viked at all, Paris. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, there was no... um. There was no plundering to be had. There was no plundering. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we have read we read the Angel War Fangs, I believe, long ago. Um, and that was a book about vampire Viking angels. And and that book, all I think that book also had. Did that book have werewolves? Yeah, I think anytime you have a vampire, you have to have the werewolf there now because they're somehow they became mortal enemies. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So I think anyway, it was just the underworld movies. You've got this, like you know, the sort of scenario we have here is you know you're opening up your writing fridge, and you get a bunch of bunch of shit. It's all maybe gonna go bad soon. Nothing really goes together, but you're like, this will be good in a soup, and you just toss I, it all I into the fantasy soup. Toss it <laughs> yeah. all into the fantasy soup, and that's what you got. <laughs> you know, it's palatable, but like barely. It's, yeah. It's not great. What you shouldn't it, have thrown in those Vikings with the witches and the werewolves and the druid at the same time. <laughs> and, and the, gods the and gods. copy of American Gods that you knocked off the shelf into the soup. <laughs> yeah, it gives it gives it that real uh <laughs> gives it that real stolen flavor. Um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. Sorry, we're we're done. Uh, we're gonna give you the actual summary of the book before we get into our cr real critiques of it, um, because as we've talked about in more recent episodes, we want you to understand the actual story, the series of events, without it being clouded with us interrupting with how we feel about it. It's better to just give you the summary, give you the story, and then tell you how we feel about it. Right. So, uh, Chris, do you want to take us away on this summary? Sure. You wrote it, so I'll let you do it. You say that in such an accusatory tone. No, 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 you didn't. No, <laughs> I'm actually very grateful that you've been writing the summaries because you do a good job, and it's one less thing I have to do, which I am always stoked about. <laughs> All right. Atticus O'Sullivan, real name Sheehan O'Sullivan, looks like a 21-year-old who runs an apothecary slash general woo-woo store in Tempe, <laughs> Arizona. <laughs> But he's really a 2,100-year-old druid. One morning, he is warned by two separate needlessly seductive Irish battle deities, one who's a crow and one who's a huntress, that his mortal enemy, Angus Og, is attempting to end their feud once and for all. We should note see, that the battle crow is the Morrigan and uh, I'm sh uh, the huntress is um, Flidish or Flidis, however you want to say that. I said Flidais. No, it's, it's Irish. I know, so it's very it's, nice. Yeah. You see, some time ago, Atticus stole the magical, store, magical sword Fraggerock. Oh, I mean, Fraggle, Fraggle Rock. Rock. Yeah, which <laughs> is how that. I read it the whole time. The magical, all-important murderer sword. Fraggle Rock! Like, that's <laughs> just what was... Anyway, he stole Fraggle Rock from Angus in the midst of some battle somewhere. While this was a humiliation for Angus, it wasn't enough of one to track him down directly, so he chose to send various assassins after Atticus until now. Atticus is first warned by the Morrigan, who is also in something of a feud with Angus, and then by Fladish, who, after a needless fuck session, decides to go hunting with Atticus and Oberon, Atticus's dog familiar with whom he can telepathically communicate. While on the hunt, Fladish mind controls Oberon and forces him to tear the throat out of a park ranger who stumbles upon the deity hunt sesh. Uh, she also the... almost attempts, she tries to control, uh, what's his name? Atticus, too, because he's in dog form at the time, but it doesn't work because of his magical necklace. Continue. This spirals out pretty much into a plot about Oberon being hunted by the Tempe police, some of which are under the thrall of Angus Og. Later, Atticus encounters a witch at his store who demands he brew a tea that would render her lover impotent. Upon establishment of a contract, the witch, Amelia slash Emily, reveals that Angus is her lover, and rendering him impotent will force him to confront Atticus directly. This is a bigger slight than the sword stealing, apparently, or, or for some reason Angus would immediately attribute his impotence to Atticus for... 
I, I'm not sure why he would do that, yeah, that but that, sure. That doesn't, that whole plot didn't seem to make any like he's, sense. So you don't get a boner with your girlfriend when you're trying to do things with her and all of a sudden you don't do, it's my nemesis that has done this to me. Well, and I, yeah, I like there just could have been a much more straightforward. It just doesn't, well, not even straightforward. It just doesn't make, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. I, I guess they were, I yeah, they were trying to get him in trouble with Angus, but it didn't even seem to me that Emily was actually ever fucking Angus, right? Like, that didn't really seem to be true. It cl claimed it to, you know, no one said she wasn't. I don't know. Anyway, despite the fact that the, this witch in the coven seemed to want the impotence tea to be a secret from Angus as well, right? Like, that was the other confusing part. Yeah, I think they were just assuming he would find out about it, but... I th there was a split in this coven as well, so maybe there was sort of the honest portion and the non-honest portion. Oh, that that's, that's true. There varyingly that's in true. on it or not. That's very true. There was. We find out. At this point, Atticus gets his vampire plus werewolf plus Viking legal team on the job, who do most of the work of protecting Atticus from local law enforcement by just generally being lawyers at them. They deflect most of the searches for Oberon, and by virtue of some of the police being beholden to Angus, Raggle Rock, they also assist in body disposal when Atticus is confronted by Brace? Breeze? Brace, I think. Brace, husband of... Brig Bridget Brid Bri Bri <laughs> Or Brid, yeah. According yeah. to the guide. I tried to follow the guide. And, and Breeze is ally to Angus Og, and later a group of Fearbolg giants also in service to Angus. Atticus easily slaughters all of them with the help of Oberon and Fragarak. Eventually, we learn that the coven Amelia belongs to is attempting to assist Angus Og in an overthrow of the pantheon that he belongs to. So Tiernan Og. Like That's the place. Yeah, and so the... Uh, but the they're Tuatha, called something else. The Tuatha de Nanan? I don't know if that's right. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me check the guide. I, um, I just called them the Danon, like the yogurt thing, <laughs> because the last words looked like it. Yeah, you know, pronounced so, Danon. some of them got mixins. Yeah. They're yogurt um, gods. Um, anyway... Breed, who is first among the Fey for now. Um, there you go. There it is. Anyway, Breed is currently first among the Fey, and Angus Og, her brother, wants to overthrow her with the help of some demonic forces from various pantheons. It seems mostly Christian, but there's probably some other stuff in there too that I just didn't uh, pay too much attention to. Obtaining Fragrock is ostensibly some part of this, so he uses the excuse of the impotence tea to confront Atticus directly. Breed even wants a direct confrontation between the, the two just to weaken both or either, it seems. So sometimes forces that are helping Atticus also throw a bone to Angus, like when Fladish helps kidnap Oberon and one of Atticus' Nordic werewolf lawyers so that he is forced to confront Angus in person once and for all. In the final scene, Angus and the segment of the Witch Coven that is loyal to him, there was a faction split that happens when the, uh, the honest part learns about this Angus allyship um, are confronted by Atticus, the remaining segment of the werewolf lawyer pack. The, there was the vampire one that just stayed home for this one. He recently had a bunch of Atticus's blood. Maybe he was drunk or something. Oh yeah, I kind of forgot, um, I forgot about that. Yeah. And also assisting in this is the independent witch contractor, Laksha. The final scene is Atticus, the remaining werewolf lawyers, not the vampire, and independent witch contractor Laksha, who he only met because she took over the body of a bartender, Granuel, that Atticus flirts with a lot of the time, and also had something to do with a necklace that Atticus once stole for Radomila, which is why he trusted her in the beginning. Um, anyway, they're all going to confront Angus, yada yada yada. Angus is cut down by Fragrak, is dragged to Christian hell by Christian death, so he doesn't get the cool Celtic afterlife benefits or something. Um, Atticus and Oberon go on a one-page hiking trip and return home to a bad harem joke. The end. <laughs> yep, that was it. Uh, sorry, I interrupted with my confusion about the exactly who was what type of stupid fucking fantasy. There's creature. so many confusing things in this book, Paris, that yeah. we were going to have to address that no matter what. Uh, all right. So, there we are. Also... I should I should mention that I don't I don't think you noted that Angus Angus sorry I don't think you noted that Atticus 
has a deal with the Morrigan, who is the Celtic death goddess, that she will not take him. So he can die, and as long as she's the only one that knows about it, he won't actually die. Whereas Angus was trying to fuck him over by summoning Christian death from hell so that he could take Atticus and actually kill him once Angus killed him on the mortal plane. I think that's an important thing to talk about. And that's why, and of course, Angus ends up getting fucked by his own plan and Christian death, you know, takes him. So he, like Chris said, goes to Christian hell rather than to Ahadadanan. That's the name of the Pantheon. No, that's, wait, no, that's the name of the place. The Pantheon is, no, you're right. Tirnanog is the place. Fuck. Yes. I know that too, because like I've, Anyway. The only reason I know this is because of old ass Power Rangers ripoff show, The Mystic Knights of Tirnanog. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I remember gonna... the Tirnanog being the place because of that show title. Yeah, like I know it's the place because it's like it's. I mean, a lot of metal bands. Like there are some metal bands that use a lot. Like uh, Absu uses a lot of um, Celtic references and stuff. So shame on me. It's Tuatha right, de Danon. That's that's the group, and then Tirnanog <laughs> is the place. Okay. Yes. I'm not. I'm gonna fuck that up again. Anyway. All right, let's Harrison's talk about... Tw- yeah, it's 20 minutes into this podcast, and we're just starting to talk about our thoughts. Well, we'll see you in three hours. All right, um, yeah. <laughs> things things I liked about this book. Chris, feel free to chime in with things you, you liked if I missed anything. So for me, I love the pronunciation guide at the beginning. You know, we we often have these these spars, even la- or na- episode 99, about, you know, how do you pronounce this? And it's confusing when you're reading something, and it's, you know, a name in a language that you're not familiar with or a language that uh, the book isn't primarily written in, like in this case. So I really appreciated that. It was a great idea. More authors should do that to tell you how to pronounce things in the book so that when you're reading it in your head, you're doing it the right way, and then you don't get into fights with your podcast co-host about how to pronounce fantasy <laughs> names. <laughs> um, but it really I shave some time off those episode lengths. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And you know me, I love trying to pronounce things the way they're supposed to be pronounced. It's important to me. Um, Because I think a lot of people just get their names mangled because the world is so English dominated. Um, And I just think that it's uh, it's worth it's worth giving it a go. So that's cool. Um, I don't think it matters too much in explicitly made up name lands, but in areas like this where we're borrowing from cultures that have stood long. Yeah. The test of time. Yeah. That's what I meant. Um, Over on the Irish where Irish werewolf, the Irish. (laughs) Just a regular. Uh, Oberon, the Irish wolfhound, is the goodest boy and best character. So I love Irish wolfhounds. They're one of my favorite breeds of dog. So I'm, I was a little biased here, but he is really written the best. He is the best character. I mean, you don't have to go too deep with dogs as long as they're friendly and excited a lot of the time to do fun stuff. I enjoy that in a dog character very much. But you know so what? I, I, yeah, I think that, the, but compare this dog writing to say... Uh, the race car one. Uh, the art of racing in the race. Yeah, where like that dog was written, <clears throat> like so. That dog was like a philosopher. He understood how television were. It's like it was just a little too. Yeah. So we cerebral. definitely understand exactly how much Oberon understands. Yes. About life around him, which is a lot. And and but I think it's it's more appropriate for what a dog or how how we can guess what a dog thinks based on how dogs act. So what I mean yeah. is like Oberon, very excited to see his master. Sometimes thinks about fucking other dogs uh, and like loves sausages. Gets He gets really hung up on like one idea. And then when he gets another one, he forgets about the one previous. Like it's very dog like. I, I just Simple think, motivation, oh, but yes. good understanding. Yeah. So I think that this was. This might be the best dog, the best pet character uh, we've ever read, I think. Mm. I don't know if there's been a better one in another book. Um, I say that. No, at, definitely at, up there. It's, been, it's episode 101. We've read a lot of books. I might be wrong. I'll but, back that. Um, great, great writing of an animal character. <clears throat> uh, next, I really appreciated the attempt to weave a lot of lore into what was actually happening. So... Um, yeah, I liked the inclusion of all the, you know, Celtic lore or whatever. I thought, you know, I thought it was it was interesting. 
<clears throat> and it actually I had some have... bearing. It had bearing on the story, right? Because it involved those yeah. gods and stuff. So that was good. I, I enjoy, yeah, the, the sort of deity lore that's mm -hmm. there. But I do think they could have leaned more into druid stuff. The only yeah, like, described spell or activity that I see here is the casting of the branches to read the future kind of a thing. Everything else is sort of generalized. Like, we don't even really get a look into, like, what's going in those weird teas that he brews. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I'm just trying to focus on things we liked here and not get yeah. into the problem. Because I sure. also have problems with the lore references, but we can talk sure. about it. Yeah. Um. I really the story was fast paced and didn't waste my time like we don't go into random side quests we don't talk about his child you know it's like the narrative itself was tightly written and it was a quick read which you know me I really appreciate that you might remember from episode 99 when I was like god damn it I read 140 pages that I didn't need to read you know that that didn't happen here I felt like every chapter was integral to the story and if you didn't read one you would be really confused about what was going on so I really 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 appreciated that this author did not waste my time. So that was great. Um, and like I said, it was a quick read. You know, this is like a, you want, you know, a couple, couple hours to kill or whatever. This is, this is there. Um, the writing itself was, I, I want to say entirely free of typographical errors. I think there might've been one typo that I noticed at all. Um, the sentences were sound, you know, everything. It, it was written like a book, you know, like a normal ass book. It was, it yeah. was decently written. There is writing um, skill here. Yeah, there is writing skill here. There was editing happening. You know, I definitely think that it's a very readable book. And I know that sound that might sound like I'm being flippant, but if you've ever listened to the show before, you know it's I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. I'm actually making a compliment. Many times we've encountered a book that is painful to get from one word to the next. Yes. Uh, this was very pleasant to read, I will say. Um, I, I like that the author at least tried for coherence and gives us explanations for a lot of things. Um, even if they're silly or bad, he at least tried. Uh, whereas, you know, whereas a lot of other books, fantasy books, it's like, well, this character is just immortal, or these people are just immortal. And you're like, why, though? At least here, Atticus is like, well, I'm immortal because of this thing that happened with the Morrigan, and blah, blah. And, you know, <clears throat> sure, you have to, like, you know, it's a book with magic. You got to suspend your disbelief. But at least we get an explanation. And so often when Chris and I read books like this, where there are fantasy elements or even, even non fantasy books just don't explain things. I really appreciated understanding why certain elements were the way they were. So <clears throat> that was good for, for most stuff. Um, all of the potential sex scenes faded to black. Oh, sweet. it's a horny There's... book, but at least, at least, at le yeah. Like the, there's definitely the, the horny levels ratcheted up pretty quickly, but at least they just ratcheted and then just fell off yeah. the radar. Like, you know, we don't have the to book see... is it's way more about the chase than the catching. God, I was so scared. I was like, we're going to have to hear about his tattooed dick, aren't we? Oh, God. I was just the <laughs> whole yeah, time. His penis I was... powers. I was oh. like, we're just two pages away from tattooed penis powers. But yeah. mercifully, even though he's naked at one point, that uh, that's not part of the deal. Yeah, it's never and and this so this segues into my next point. Uh, love interest and romance is never really the focus of this book, along with like so. There's no there's no graphic sex scenes. There's no um yeah. There's no romance subplot. So all of that was. Great. I mean, he's messing around and flirting with people. Yeah, but it's not. It's the, he's, he's, you no... cannot tie him down, man. That's yeah. kind of the, the vibe I got here. Is yeah. that he ain't no one woman man. Yeah, which is a, another thing. But anyway. I appreciated that there was no romantic subplot that I had to groan through. Um, no time travel. I really appreciated that because I was feel really like... expecting that with some yes. gods involved. Yeah, I was really happy that there was no time travel because in so many of these books, like the Angel War Fangs, um, even I would even say Demon Pig because there was like some time strands rewoven. Uh, what's some other uh, sort of truth ever have time travel? Not yet. It's gonna. I bet when oh, we get deeper yeah, into it. Oh, yeah, that's true. We've, we've only read three of the books, but um, there are other books we've read that have had time travel. So anyway, I just appreciate not having to sit here and go, well, that doesn't make any fucking sense, you know? Yeah. Um, and lastly, the thing I really like... Please liked, leave causality in sta intact, yeah, please. Yeah, which I appreciated. You know, there's, there's you know, temporal continuity. Fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> um, hooray. hooray. <laughs> that's the bar. Um, you know, and my favorite thing is that part of the real he evil in this book is the American police force. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> they really are the major, like some of the major it's, foot soldiers in terms of antagonists, and yeah. just kind of go coming in there and fucking stuff up. Because like, like even the one when... scene, <laughs> sorry, where one officer has his mind control to take a shot at Atticus. And then he is, this is the one thing that I disagree on what would happen. The other five officers in the room point their guns at the officer that shot at Atticus needlessly. And they murder him by all five of them opening fire on him after he yeah, tries to once. take over for another shot. At once. Because that's just how police do. <laughs> it's how they do in America. Um, so and, I mean, this is a book of stereotypes, right? So yeah, I guess you're right. This is a book. Of they stereotypes. come all in the package there. If, if that's what you're doing. Yeah, and he was like, "There, there's a note where at least oh, I can't search my own notes. That sucks. Fucking goddamn it." Uh, there's a point where Atticus is like, uh, he's feeling bad because the guy was mind controlled to shoot him." Um, and he's like, "Fuck this whole guy's life." He's like, "What's gonna happen to him?" And I was like, "I don't know." paid leave a severance package and a misdemeanor like yeah <laughs> like don't worry too much about it atticus he good yeah. <laughs> i was just feeling a little salty about police uh again as chris pointed out it's a book of stereotypes so that's pretty much everyone in this book except atticus who gets to be cooler than school because he has some no, he's a stereotype extremely too. mild depth to him well you know he's a stereotype too He's the same character we read about in every book like this. Oh, uh, that's the, true. That's, yeah. So anyway, those are all the things I liked. Chris, I don't know if there was anything I missed. Um, and I mean, no, it's, a you pretty covered... good list. it's a pretty good list of things to like, right? Yeah, you covered all the, the stuff there that was worth, I mean, Oberon was the major reason for me to bother to continue flipping the pages. Yes, agreed. I was very, um, very invested in the dog and the dog owes fate. Um. So, um, oh, the dog wasn't hurt either, which I appreciate. Yes, true. Actually, I would have appreciated some kind of consequence happening to anyone, but we can we can talk about that. Sure. <laughs> um, so, so we have shared what we liked about the book. Um, there is a lot we didn't like about the book, so this part is going to be longer. Um, <laughs> apologies, but prepare that is- yourselves. Prepare yourselves. Uh, and again, this is, this was a patron recommendation, so we have to read things that are higher tier patrons' request of us. Um, so this isn't something that we picked up and like thought would be bad, though admittedly, if I saw this in a store, I probably would. So this was something that we were, uh, you know, it was, it was requested of our patrons and we're reading it. Um, so it's a little different than our normal stuff. You know, this wasn't like, this wasn't our choice to read. That being said, Deus Ex Magica stalks the terrible book club across space and time. Can't escape it. Good old reliable Deus Ex Magica for just writing yourself out of a corner. Yeah, so as much as I was saying <clears throat> I appreciated that the author at least tried to <clears throat> give some coherence and explanation for, for a lot of things, he really misses some important ones to not explain or or rather to not define further so that they made sense and one of these things is um <clears throat> sorry one of these big points is the actual abilities of the druid and as chris was talking about like how he is able to kind of more detail on what he's doing so um i guess we can just get into the the powers section and magical stuff section so um <clears throat> One of the things that really got me, I I found it very annoying that the protagonist had to constantly tell us that he had magical tattoos that connected him to the earth and that's where he drew power. He has magical tattoos. Oh my God, he has. It's like the most annoying patron at a bar who just won't shut up about his fucking tattoos and how meaningful they are. And you're like, okay, buddy, uh-huh. And you just try to get away, but the bar is too tightly packed. I don't know if anyone can remember a time when that was the case, when you were in a room with that many people, but it's very uncomfortable and I don't miss it. And you just can't get away from this guy who just can't stop telling you about how fucking cool and meaningful his tattoos are. That's how this felt. Cause it, it didn't need to be brought up every single time he was using his powers. It was just really shorned in there. And it's like, I get it. You already explained it at the beginning. We don't need to keep coming around to it. We understand the tattoos ground. Got it. Uh, that was annoying. Um, and again, that's just a, that's something that was annoying. That didn't have to be. <laughs> also. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know how true this is for supposed druid stuff overall, if that's how it was really supposed to work. But when I think druid, I think a little bit more botanical and stuff. And like, yeah, he brews all these teas and stuff, but he never really goes into exactly what's in those immortalities. Well, he says that he it, he had he learned herb craft from uh, um, Ermid. Ermid is that short? Sure, but like, I I don't even care about where he learned it. Just put a little flavor text about like what you're throwing in there. Well, he does. He does talk a little bit about what's his, in his herb garden. He doesn't tell us. But he doesn't everything. give us like any kind of like, and then I use this to make this hat. Like, oh, tell yeah, me yeah. why you would put this herb in that tea for, I don't know, some sort of flavoring and some logic for me to grab onto. Besides, I have a tea that makes me immortal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I brewed the tea and that makes me immortal and I drank it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah. And I think I think that I want more herbs. I want more druid shit. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, I also I had a similar complaint about the spells, how they sounded very D&D ish. It's like, yes, point your finger and say this word. And then uh, and, you know, if I, fuck, I can't remember. I made a note about it, but it was just like it read like you were literally reading a spell in a and d grimoire like in a D index when you're putting together a character and i just think when you're writing a book like this you just need a little you need a little bit more <laughs> i want to be fair to D here in that they do have like components lists for every spell they've written in fifth edition so if you want to role play what you have to do to cast the spell more than point finger say magic word it you can do that so even D and D is that's, going that's way true. more in depth than these spells, which is just I point at something and I cast camouflage. It's yeah. more like the person role playing the D and D character than reading about the D and D character. I mean, and I get that he, the author, did try to say like, well, he has, you know, he uses certain power and he has to recharge from the earth, and he does have a magical necklace, but they only it only lasts so long until he recharges it or whatever. Um, <laughs> He's got to charge his Jo crystal again. Yeah, it's kind of... <laughs> Gotta charge his horny crystal every once in a while or else he's no no longer invulnerable. It's to kind of... all magic? Yeah. I, this, yeah. So let, let's... Mm, yeah, I didn't like... The necklace was just taking things too far. I It was just taking things way too far. I get that the guy's been around for 2,100 years, but the fact that he has mastered technology that gods and goddesses haven't and that allows him to best pretty much everyone... It Lame. just seems it. Yeah, there's no. And because of that, I mean, that's really the like that really prevents almost all consequences from happening to him. Yeah, he's immune to pretty much most magic thrown at him because he's got a lump of iron around his neck that he also, to be fair, he go, he does talk about some of the bindings that he put on that, but he doesn't go into specifics about the bindings. Well, the only time he goes into binding specifics is like this one time where he describes how binding works, but then every other spell that he does bindings with, he doesn't say what he binds what with what, which is the well, annoying the, part. The me. amulets weren't, I don't, they weren't bindings really. Some of them were like the water one. I forget, but, um, so it's not just iron, you know, he's created, it's like a, I don't know, like imagine like a druid Claire's, I don't know, you go in and get a charm necklace and it's got all these little different charms on it. Um, the charms are the bindings, like he bound things to the charms because there's one sentence in the book where he says, all a druid does is bind things. Oh, that's I guess, the only thing we really do. I guess that's true. I, anyway, it doesn't matter. The The point here is that the magical necklace just kind of, it just makes him way overpowered. And I I don't find that fun. I don't find it fun to feel like there are never going to be any consequences for a character um, or for anyone who is a protagonist in the protagonist loop. Like, literally no one... I, I think we lose a couple werewolves whose names we don't even know. Yeah, they're just faceless werewolves. Yeah, so we don't actually, no one actually dies or even faces any negative consequences. There are that not, one cop does. Yeah, but he's not a good guy. So, <laughs> yeah. like, he's not painted as a good guy in the novel. So, yeah, that, I mean, he, he even says that he has a fist of death because of his amulets. Like, it makes, it, it, you know, he, he can be super strong, super fast. He can s turn into an otter and swim, be underwater. Like, it's just. 
I did like Where the further D and D thing of you only get four animal forms. That's your limit. Like, I did laugh at that. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, that's pretty. I mean, at least there was some limit there. But uh, yeah, I I just didn't like that the amulets made him impervious to almost everything. Uh, they they deaden even uh, like some most effects. It's just. It's too much. Pretty much any witchy charm, the literal hellfire thrown at him just doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it's too much. It's too much. And I know he's a more technically, you know, a mortal being, but he also explains that gods and goddesses can also be killed by mundane means, which is actually part of the reason that the cold iron that his necklace is forged out of is something that the Fae are afraid of. Uh, I did a little bit of reading on this because I was curious about why iron is always mentioned as anathema to the Fey. I mean, in every, and not just this book, but it's a common thing. Chris, I don't know that you've. Yeah, I've seen but, it a couple times. Yeah, a lot of things I've read. And I was like, why, why iron, though? And so, you know, some people say, oh, it's because it's a symbol of industrialization. I was like, that's dumb. Iron's an element. Like, it comes from the earth. It's not like, sure, it's used for modern human stuff, but that seemed silly. Like, you know, uh, but then it, if, if you did, I did some more reading and cold iron is actually, it, it's not a reference to like a cold forging process or anything. Apparently, again, just from my random readings, it refers, to, it, it's more akin to the, um, modern phrase of cold steel. So like a terrifying sharp weapon. So... Based on that interpretation, I feel that makes the most sense because if you believe that gods and goddesses, um, they might be, you know, Im immortal, but they're not uh, impervious to death by slicing, right? <laughs> or mm -hmm. poking or, you know, whatever. Um, they, they can be, you know, fey, the fae can be harmed by mortal means. Um, so cold iron is really just saying, like, get that pointy shit away from me. Yeah. Obviously, this book uses a different interpretation of that because the amulet is not a weapon. It's just a necklace. So there and again, I mean, you have Fraggle fantastic. Rock there, which is basically the God Stabber, right? Oh, that's that's yeah. what Fraggle, Fraggle Rock is. Yeah, it's just it just cleaves through all armor, even armor that would like. Yeah, even magically forged armor, which is why I'm like, this guy has two things that make him just way overpowered already. And I get that he's a human, right, and not a god or a goddess. But really, what is even the difference at this point between the gods and goddesses and him as an overpowered, technically immortal human with a bunch of powers? Like, to me, it's like, where is even the line? And he talks about how these gods and goddesses were, I think some of them were once people. So, yeah, he's he's a god for all intents and purposes. Like, I don't, I don't know. That and that's just not interesting to me. And I get yeah. maybe the tone of this book was not looking to be like very serious all the time. It's definitely somewhat comedic in its leaning, right? Sure, sure. Like if this was a TV show, it would be a dramedy of yeah. sorts. Oh yeah. So if while we're talking about powers, um, the power stuff gets a little wacky, and I found inconsistent, like with him specifically. So, for example, he's like. Druids, you know, druid tattoos draw our power from the soil. So he literally has to touch either with his hands or his flesh has to touch soil. And that's how he regenerates his power source. Um, think of him like a, a solar charger or something, you know, except he has to touch earth instead of sun rays. Um, but then they're in the desert in Arizona and he puts his hand in the sand and he's like, oh, there's not there's I can't draw much power from here and i'm like dude sand is a type of soil like why wouldn't you be able to draw power from sand it is a type of soil it is made up of the same components that doesn't make any sense what should have happened is he should have said something like druids can draw power from certain soils like loam silt or wet soils but have trouble drawing from dry sand or something i mean that would have been fine that would have been a fine explanation but he just says soil but sand is a type of soil and i know this sounds very like i'm like i'm being pedantic but it's just a fact that should have been checked and and accounted for i think most people just classify sand as something completely different so they would just like mentally walk over that being like oh yeah you can't grow stuff in sand so it wouldn't work 
but you can't grow stuff insane. Yeah, it's it's just a dumb. There, there's another. This is getting. Mm, I don't want to get too off topic. Let, let's let's stick to the magical stuff and the inaccuracies involved. So he's with uh, Fladish or Fladish during the hunt thing, and they're they're about to get caught by cops or whatever. And he's like, "Oh, I can't cast invisibility like Fladish." And then he's like, "Oh, but I can cast camouflage and everything all the time, and that basically works like invisibility." I mean, I know he explains that it's slightly different, but it works just the same throughout the entire book, just like invisibility. So that doesn't make sense. And then there's that whole scene in the park hunt. The whole thing makes no sense. The whole ranger scene is just like, they're like, oh no, we're going to get caught. And it's like, just make yourselves invisible. And then when the cops show up, they're not going to see anything. If you make yourselves and the, everything around you invisible, like, why is there any, there, there is no risk to them. It's this invented I think the ranger risk. catches them by surprise. No, they have a few minutes to talk before the ranger. They can hear someone, right? No. No, the, the reason, ranger. Right. The ranger is surprised at them. He has a stealth earring given to oh, him. Oh, you're right. You're right. But still, they could have just. Sorry, I'm thinking of right after that when they hear. Oh, when the cops are coming immediately for some reason, which also I had a problem with because like they care. One dude gets his throat torn out in the middle of a park, and like five cop cars are bearing down on you guys like three minutes later. Yeah, I don't know who called the cops in the middle of this park wasteland. I guess it's assumed to be Angus knew his ranger that was like sneaking up on them was murdered or something. Yeah, so he maybe. must have just called it in because he's like, oh, I felt him die. Yeah, I guess that that could be explained, but it's not explained in the text. I guess you could make that assumption. But again, and you could still just bury the body and go invisible, which I guess they did in a way. They could have just all gone in. They could have made everything invisible. They didn't have to bury anything and that just drag it off to the side. Everyone goes invisible and then you just wait for the police to leave. Also this. <laughs> Like, I just don't, there was no, it, all the urgency was invented. And then even when they're like, okay, we should be invisible. They wait to make themselves invisible until they are running away. And it's like, no, just make yourselves invisible right now. Why are you waiting? Why are you giving anyone a chance to see you? I, I just, that whole thing made no sense. And then also, the whole, the mystery. Also, gods been, with all this magic can't just disintegrate a body. That's like a never a solution. So I'm assuming they just can't do. They have to yeah. like still physically get rid of it. But I don't know, man. Like, yeah, it's some in some ways I appreciate the limits on power in that way. But at the same time, yeah, it's like if you can just make things. Also, invisible. hold on. The way that scene works is that Fladish like draws the earth up around the body, and Atticus is like, "Oh, it's too fresh soil for people to like, you know, not find the body." Mm-hmm. But. If you're a first responding officer coming to a scene where someone said, hey, I think someone got murdered here. I I heard a murder or I found a body or something. Wouldn't it take you like a little bit to land on let's dig up the earth here first? Yeah, I think so. Especially it was also the dark. So. I think we're just supposed to assume that Angus to- like kept tipping the yeah. cops off really well or something. Yeah, we, I think we are because we later learn that he had his claws in them. But um, yeah, so that didn't make sense. And then there's more stuff that doesn't make sense that spins out of that scene so we can keep talking about it. So this is the scene in, we- in which Fladish uh, gains control over Oberon because she is, well, in this, in this interpretation of Fladish in this book that the author has chosen, she is a goddess of the hunt, though that is not totally agreed on whatever anyway so she get, she has control over all animals and for some reason atticus just doesn't even think about that he's like oh yeah i'm gonna transform into a wolfhound too we're gonna go on a hunt together like and and by the way right before this the morrigan is like yo don't sleep with anyone they might try to do something to you don't like hang out with ladies that you're into it's bad news and he's like oh yeah you got it and then he's like oh fladish you want to bang and then go hunt and i'll like (laughs) turn into a form that you can totally control yeah let's do that you were explicitly warned about this by the crow who was naked in front of you as a lady for horny reasons hope maybe just hoping you would fucking listen to her maybe that's what she was maybe she's smart i think yeah smart uh anyway so like that whole thing so (laughs) that whole thing is it's all just fucked from the beginning because this is all early in the book. And then to make things worse, so she's, you know, his, of course, Atticus's necklace prevents him from 
being totally in Fleetish's thrall, but um, his dog Oberon, of course, is helpless because he's just a mundane dog. Oberon isn't magical, and so Fleetish directs him to maul the cop. That's how he ends up dying. He rips his throat out. No, poor dog is all traumatized. He's like, "What did I do? I didn't mean to hurt anybody," which is really sad. But, um, so immediately Atticus is like, "The cops are gonna track us through the dog," and I'm like, "What? <laughs> how are the cops gonna know anything about the dog? Did you register your dog in a dog DNA database with the police? If so, that was dumb." It's never stated, but, like, you have to wonder, why is he worried about this? There's no way they can track the... It's not like he's the only person with an Irish wolfhound in in Phoenix. Or... Yeah, but they do come knocking on his door immediately. But because a neighbor tattles on him and says, Hey, my neighbor has a big scary dog that might have... You know, maybe that murdered someone or something. There was an article in the newspaper that there, a murder happened that was probably a dog, which they got those lab results back, like, in 12 hours or yeah, something. Yeah, they were like, like they, we think it's an Irish wolfhound. And I'm like, well, they could have had... They could have done a fiber analysis. Like, forensic labs do have various fibers and hairs and stuff to compare against. But you're right. It was... Like, was nothing else going on in Phoenix in 2010? It is a very quick turnaround on, we found this body. Oh, it must be a dog. Oh, it, we are going to get those lab results back. It's an Irish wolfhound. Uh, also, like, I I just think it's, it's absurd to think that that would have... I mean, in some ways, it makes a little more sense because you find out Angus Olg is controlling a lot of the police, and that's why it's all falling into place, but I still think that it's and Just. even then, the consequences, Atticus has to cast a camouflage spell on Oberon all the time, which isn't even anything for him. Yeah, and what was I going to say? So there's oh, no yeah. tension in the hiding. You could no. just make Oberon invisible and send him, like, completely out the back door where he... I don't understand why Oberon hangs out while he's invisible where all the cops are yeah, when he could know. just walk his ass out the door. He walks through a restaurant fine camouflage. It mentions like his tail wagging might cause a weird air disturbance, but I don't think Oberon's tail would be wagging if he had to slink out carefully. Yeah. At least stand in the other room. Yeah. I, I just find that whole, that whole thing we just described, like the hunt to the dog, concern it just none of it was at none of the urgency was real based on what we know about the characters it just and their magic it just doesn't make sense <sighs> that was a long one um there are some other things other weird inconsistencies having to do with magic stuff so there's one page where Atticus says oh he's not very good at reading auras and then a chapter later he's giving you this intense rundown uh, of like an aura analysis on the bartender mind you he doesn't figure out that she's being possessed by someone, but he still seems pretty adept at reading auras. He actually mentions reading auras several times in the book. So him saying, oh, I'm not very good at this doesn't make sense. Like, just say that he's decent at it. He's good at it. Not an expert, but good. Don't say he's bad at this and then be like, oh, but he does it all the time. And he's yeah, because right. he doesn't like, fail or misread, right? right. Correct. Correct. Um, there's also some other things like, uh, at the very beginning and then later in the book, there are just outright battle massacres happening in broad daylight or broad twilight in the streets of Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix is not like some podunk desert town in Arizona. Are you sure it's Tempe all the time? I thought it was Phoenix. I, I thought it was just Tempe all the time. But that's still a town. Uh, yeah, Temp- I mean, like Tempe a- and Phoenix are both populated places y- yeah. with universities. <laughs> you know? And restaurants that people go and have lunch to. Yeah. So- Not a ghost town where you can just... So even though it's somewhat cloaked by fey magic where dude has to put on his DBZ scouter magic lens to like really <laughs> see what's going on sometimes. Like... People still see the deaths happen. They can, that's the thing. He's very specific. He's very uh, specific about telling the reader they might not be able to see the Fey elements, but they can still see people fighting and dying. Um, in fact, his neighbor, Mrs. McDonough, sees him kill someone. Sees him kill... Uh, Bress. Bress? In yeah. the street. And, I mean, 
I just think it's insane. Like at the very very beginning, she rolls with it. By the way, she's down. Yeah, Mrs. McDonough's is fucking cool. Um, <laughs> second best character after Oberon. I would um, say, although, is this the part where I can bring up my major problem with? The- no, 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 no. We, okay. that's in the that's right. in the female character section. We're sure. still we're still in the other one. We're we're getting there. Um, so right at the beginning, he gets into a violent altercation where he kills several Fey. Uh, I think five fairies or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and this iron, he summons this like iron elemental to like finish them off and stuff. This happens at his store in front of his store, and he's like. Oh, sick. It's lunchtime. No one's out. No one saw that. And I was like, is Arizona opposite from Boston? Because in Boston at lunchtime, everyone's out in the streets getting lunch or going for a walk. (laughs) So apparently in Arizona at lunchtime, everyone locks their shit down. (laughs) It's lunchtime. You leave me in this closet with this sandwich. It is my time. Don't talk to me. I'm not going outside where it's hot. Are you crazy? Everyone locks their doors, close their blinds. It's lunchtime. (laughs) I don't know if that I don't know if there is really like a regional difference, but it seemed but very he, strange. To he's me. also never in any place where there might be people in this city. Yeah. Anytime, <laughs> any fi- except Mrs. McDonough's house, which I'm guessing must be on some giant hill off on its own somewhere. No, he's he's has he has the later fights with Bress and with the Fierbolgs in neighborhoods. In his neighborhood. <laughs> and I know things are spread out in Arizona, but like, come on. <laughs> They're, the and only I, I mean, people like, that ever see anything are Mrs. McDonough and the neighbor, his Lebanese neighbor that he hates, Mr. Smergian, who, I don't know, doesn't like his dog and they have this tiff, neighborly tiff or whatever. But, like, that's easily remedied because he, because, oh, because guess what? His, uh, is it the vampire? The vampire can just erase people's minds. Just erase their yes. memories. I think that's Ta-da. the only reason one of the lawyers had to be a vampire, Paris. Yes, it is. I also don't know why vampires have that ability. Why is that a thing that vampire can do? I don't get it. I'm sure that was established in some, I don't know, ex- extemporaneous vampire lore. I mean, where do you cut off your legit vampire lore, Paris? Is your line like just before Twilight, or are you including stuff like Interview with the Vampire or like Blade? <laughs> I just don't... I don't think it's common. I mean, I think that there's common lore that says, you know, vampires can enthrall people, but just walking up to him and going, your memory's wiped. Like fucking men in black shit is a little weird. I guess, you know, whatever. It, fine. Make your vampire do whatever. But I still think it's fucking lazy to have a memory wipe in your back pocket. Yeah. Again, no consequences instant pro- for It's anything. always instant problem solvers. Invisibility, <laughs> memory wiping. Even the highest tension scenes are the hide the body scenes. But then it's always just, and then I made them invisible and my lawyers were lawyers at the cops. And then the werewolves buried all the bodies because they're good diggers as dogs or I don't know, something. But yeah, it's... Mm, that really fucks with me. That, that shit drives me nuts because... There's because then you're like, you don't have to spend any creative time thinking out a way, thinking a way out of this problem or making their again, making there any real tension or urgency or conflict. Because, you know, almost immediately, you know, like this guy's way overpowered. He's he's a crafty guy. He's going to get at everything. And it's like, well, the, how is that fun? Everyone writes books like this. I suppose the fun is supposed to be the snarky sarcasm that pervades the character and the rest of the book and, like, the funny situations. Oh, like, you mean, oh, the, this, da- oh, you mean this... the dad jokes, borderline misogynism? And... Yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, this fun. witch is 21 years old in physical appearance, but she's really 90. Well, let's hang on. Before we get there, let's just finish talking about a few other things. Like, there was a point where he, bo- I mean, this is really minor, but he boils down Mesopotamia to basically just modern day Iraq. And that's not true. Like Mesopotamia also included parts of Iran, Syria, Turkey, and other countries. Like you, the whole like just saying, ah, Mesopotamia's Iraq. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of Iraq, but it's also other things. It's not just kind of like the whole coyote thing in here too, oh, where yeah, you're right. in this land where you would assume there would be some native deities because it's not like American gods rules, where like the less people that believe in them, the less of them well, there it are. Is that. Or it is that he specifically states that, and which is why I'm. That's another thing. But you're right, and that he totally boils down all native uh, North American native deities into coyote. 
That's it. Not even anything else or a mention of previous ones that could have been there. No, he's just like, oh yeah, it's all it's all just Coyote, and Coyote takes many forms as a trickster, you know, in, in different uh, native beliefs, but it's just Coyote. And it's like, it's just Coyote? <laughs> I know that I know that native populations are low, but like in Arizona, you got a lot of people there that are native. I don't know how you of different say... kinds too. Yeah. It's not just like there would be just one pantheon. Sure, maybe they wouldn't be super powerful if if there weren't millions of people believing them, but they would still exist and be kicking around and be able to do stuff. I I just because because actually Chris, like you were just saying. He does directly take Neil Gaiman's god um, construction from American gods and say that, you know, gods uh, exist if people believe in them. And there are different versions depending on what you believe. So, sorry, this is a spoiler for American God, a mild spoiler for American gods if you've never read it or seen the show. I highly recommend you watch the show if you don't have the patience to read because it's very good. But um, in American gods, like, uh, there are different shades of Jesus, and they're all real. There's um, Hispanic Jesus, there's black Jesus, there's white Jesus, there's Middle Eastern Jesus, because people do believe in these different flavors of Jesus, and therefore they do exist. And they all exist simultaneously as separate entities. So, um, yeah, it kills me that he just rips that from American gods. And I don't know if maybe, maybe Neil Gaiman took that from something, I don't know, but... It feels like this is a direct rip <laughs> for me. Maybe I'm wrong, but it, the book really is poor anime version of American Gods with no. Irish mythology sprinkled over top. Well, American Gods also includes Irish mythology, it includes everything. But, it has African. Sure, stuff, but Irish this stuff. one is focusing more on the Irish part. Well, there's a bit of an Irish focus, and anyway, we don't have to talk about American Gods. Yeah. But it does kill me that American Gods is a much better version of this. Um, Obviously, I'm not. I always try to couch these things so that people don't think I'm saying, oh, American Gods is perfect. It's untouchable. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's much better than this. It's a much better version of this. It is not perfect. And American Gods rant continuing. Um, Just want to talk about Chris. I know you're you're fucking rare and to get to the female characters part. But we got two things to cover before we get there. Just bear with me. Um, One, the main character, Atticus keeps giving his dog Oberon, who is a mundane Irish wolfhound, coffee, coffee mate, Irish coffee creamer, um, and tea. Those things will all kill your dog. <laughs> you cannot give dogs coffee, coffee creamer, and tea. You can't give them sugar and cream and caffeine. Those things are bad for dogs. And of course, this is a, a quantity issue, right? So if you give your dog one lap of coffee or creamer, it's not going to die. But if, as Atticus does, you routinely brew your dog coffee with creamer, with sugar in it, and also tea, that will make your dog violently ill and kill it. And, and Oberon never suffers any, any problems. And there's no, there's nothing, again, there's nothing magical about the dog. He doesn't make any, he doesn't do anything to the dog to make it magical. It's just written as though it's totally fine to give your dog coffee, cream, and sugar, and it like like again, this is a this is one of those like basic like sand is a type of soil things that I really <laughs> just think somebody should have checked because it's just so obviously bad. I, I don't give your dog caffeine, dairy products, or sugar. <laughs> to be fair, I didn't even know you weren't supposed to give your dog caffeine, but I. Don't give dogs caffeine because I'm just not stupid enough to try that. And so. and again, this is this is a you know a dose issue. Yeah, he is a big dog, and if again, if your dog has a couple laps of your coffee, it'll be fine. It's not going to die or get really sick. Yeah. If it's a really tiny dog, it might. If it's like a teacup poodle and it has some laps of your coffee, yeah, you might be going to the vet later. But this is an Irish Wolfhound again. But it seems like a very routine for thing for that. He's like, I brewed us coffee and made him coffee and made him tea and blah blah. It's like. This poor dog. You're going to fucking kill your dog. And Irish wolfhounds aren't even long lived. They're very big and they die very early. Why are you shortening the life of the best character in the book? God <laughs> damn it. I'm so fucking mad. Oh, uh, just the fact that nobody on the editing team was like, hey, maybe we should see if that's a thing you should do with dogs. <laughs> 
it's just bad it's just bad um so anyway this is my weird angry psa about not feeding your worthwhile to spend some time elaborating on that yeah and then lastly another thing that i consider an inconsistency um why is this character so modern when he's 2100 years old and has lived all over the world including parts of asia central and south america mediterranean i i just why is he so modern why are all of his references to things in the last 50 years um, well, blending is one of the important survival skills, as he tells you, and he's just really good at that part. Like, he's really good at everything. Well, yes, but who are... He's not telling this story to... Like, is is that what we're to assume? He's telling this story to me, even though this isn't written, like, it's to anyone. It's just a... You know, like a... a it's just being told. You don't know who he... I guess, I guess actually it doesn't even... It's just a... I, I'm not really sure how to frame this. There is no framing, First I guess is my point. Yeah. So why would he? all of his references be to fucking Kevin Costner? Well, that paragraph is just a toxic waste dump. We'll talk about that in a second. How about the fucking slap chop joke, Paris? You like that one? Oh, the slap chop <laughs> joke. Um, He's constantly talking... I mean, he's talking about he tries to keep driving the point home that he's very cool and alternative he's like oh yeah went to a slayer went to slayer mosh pit uh putting on some roger and gabriella like you know i just want people to know that like this bookstore is not for the regulars you know and he's fucking being serious about it and i can't believe that it's absurd i i just i i can't believe it's very difficult for me to believe that this nearly all powerful Im- mar- you know basically immortal being who's lived for 2100 years is like you know what makes me cry kevin costner in the field of dreams like no that's not believable to me for <laughs> out a of my 2100 fe- years of living it's just that one kevin costner bit in, in field of dreams man that's the one thing that has gotten me never mind you know, hundreds of years of like loved ones and friends dying. Yeah. That don't get me. It's fucking Field of Dreams, boy. Yeah, and uh I do want to read that Field of Dreams. What about paragraph. when you're fucking real dead? I guess he says like his dad was kind of an asshole. Sucked. So that's a- he oh, he very just casually mentions he had a kid at some point, but then never talks about it. Doesn't <laughs> say anything. Just Because that kid probably died just like everything. But yeah, that's not that doesn't weigh on his soul at all. I'm just trying to find the Field of Dreams chapter. Ah, here it is. Um, This is just a problematic paragraph in and of itself, so I'm going to read it. Um, He's talking about how he can't, how uh, there's a spell on his sword that he can only remove with generous crying, generous tears. And he's explaining that tears used to be almost impossible for him to summon. Sorry, I'm just going to read this as written. Those tears used to be almost impossible for me to summon, I admit, until I watched Field of Dreams. When Kevin Costner asks his dad at the end if he'd like to have a catch, I just completely lose my shit. Any guy who doesn't is either in mixed company when he sees it or was blessed with an unusually sensitive father. I blubber and sob like a jilted girl every time I watch that scene or even when I think about it. My dad would never have played catch with me. Never mind that he's been dead for more than 2,000 years and baseball hadn't been invented then. My dad's idea of bonding was throwing me in the tar pits to teach me a lesson, though I'm not sure what that lesson was except to stay the hell away from Da. So if I ever think of a reason why the cloak cloak on the sword should come off, all I will have to do is think of Kevin Costner and his chance to have a moment of peace with his dad and the tears will flow like mountain springs. So even if this was trying to be funny, it's... Just, it made me cringe the whole way through. Yeah, um, there's a lot of that. Saying, like, you can't cry when you're in mixed company. Like, if you're in front of women, you you, you can't cry as a man. Um, if you have a um, if you have a sensitive father, it's I guess you're blessed and it's unusual. He's right about that, unfortunately. Um, and referencing intense crying as the blubbering of a jilted girl is fucked up to me. Um, 
I just that whole paragraph is just trash. Yeah, it's just another thing about like exactly when are men allowed to cry? Yeah, got to further codify that. Yeah, while we're on the subject up. of cringy as hell humor, by oh, the way. Oh yeah, yeah, we talked about the cringy as hell humor. Let's do it. Uh, let's go back to that slap chop joke. There's a part where I don't know his lawyer's talking to him and he says something a bit off putting, and so the line is, "I stared at him like he just offered to sell me the slap chop for 19.99 plus shipping and handling." What a fucking stinker of a joke, Paris. Holy Madame shit. Tis. Yeah. And then he's in his herb garden emptying out uh, his, like, herb boxes and says, there's never enough time. Despite <laughs> time. <laughs> um, whoa, my lawyer has ghouls on speed dial? He kicks so much ass. Like, that. that's literally a line. And that is how I read it in my mind because it is cartoonishly stupid shades of monster hunter international yes this is very mhi um anyway lastly i um he says that he is quote atticus says he is quote utterly repulsed by these beings talking about gods and goddesses who robbed creatures of their own free will which is funny because uh, he, you know, brews tea to give to people so that they can fuck with others without their knowledge, taking away their free will. He also has his friend erase minds to avoid persecution and lets them get fucked over like his neighbor. I think that interferes with free will pretty heavily. Um, so just a total pot kettle situation here that's never rectified. Like, <clears throat> I, the, the protagonist is hard to like. It's very hard to like, at least for me. Yeah, he's just kind of shitty and snarky. Yeah, and I, and again, I think that um, when we were talking about the the framing and how there's there's no framing here, so to me, the fact that he's only making references references from the past couple of dozen couple of decades makes no sense as the being he purports to be. If it was framed like, hey, I'm telling you, this person who is reading this in 2010. I mean, this was published 2011. So, Hey, I'm telling you a person in 2010 and like, I'm going to only reference stuff recently. So you understand me. That would make more sense. I but guess it, it would have been framed like that. there's even some opportunities for jokes in here where he could have been like, you know, Oh, it was, this reminded me of that time that I had to cut off some peasant's arm in this, you know, like a stupid joke about something that happened 500 th- years ago or something like that. You could have at least thrown some of that in there so he doesn't seem like all he really remembers is stuff that happens 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, obviously he references the battles with Angus and stuff, but like only in context of like plot specific stuff, never as, you know, service to the humor that is trying to pervade the book somewhat. Like he doesn't reference anything unless it's specifically some plot oriented event. Yeah. It doesn't give him the amount of immortality depth that I would like. I agree. And again, this isn't this is a problem in other books where you have these all powerful old ass, you know, ancient immortal or nigh immortal characters and all they can talk about is like the last two decades and it doesn't make any sense. All right, Chris, we're here. We've arrived. We've arrived at uh the talking about female characters and sexuality in this book section. Take well, Lord. Oh, well, the my main problem with this dude I mean, he's out here, he's got goddesses kissing him all the time. He will, you know, get down with the Irish huntress goddess yeah, at the drop of a hat just yep. because, you know, they need to kill some time. Um, he even thinks about you know, some the the very young looking witch, even though she eventually just ends up being kind of like a nuisance to him oh, that like... walks into his store. Yeah. Um, and she's act like he, he said oh like, she's like actually ninety years old, but and you know, he kind of has flirty thoughts about her at first but mrs mcdonough whom he mows her lawn regularly does yard work for her um he hangs out with her all the time he hangs out with her all the time they're good friends she's even said hey buddy if i was 50 years younger buddy you can't throw her one why not yeah there's a double standard here where you know he can look you know, cute and 21 forever. And I guess that just colors 
his attraction because he yeah he doesn't see mrs mcdonough as desirable even though it's like the one woman he has a connection with who isn't a goddess you know um he he she's only attracted to youthful bodies which i also think is something that would change over 2100 years of existence don't you Chris? i know right <laughs> like, like you'd learn to appreciate some other stuff here and there maybe you actually married someone with that that poor who'd you have the kid with dude didn't she get old yeah, I don't know. We maybe don't, you learn maybe... to appreciate. I guess not. Maybe... Well, this was this was probably written with the intent to be a series. I know it is a series, and it was it was probably written with that intent. So perhaps in later books, it's Granuel. I don't know. It's Granuel. It's going to be Granuel. Yeah, it's probably going to be Granuel. <laughs> but like Mrs. M again, Mrs. McDonough here, willing. If she's saying she's willing, probably able. Yeah. So I just mean... like, why not, dude? I know. It's, it's because it's she looks her. old, isn't it? It's because she looks old. And also, I also don't like that he judges Mrs. McDonough for drinking in the morning. I was like, yo, man, she's old as hell. She doesn't have responsibilities. You just let her have a good time, you fuckhead. Like, I would never judge a, a fucking 70-year-old-plus person for, like, drinking at 10 a.m., you also, know, I would, whatever. real anti-marijuana vibe in this whole book where stoners oh, yeah. are complete idiots all the time. And there's a segment where he's like, some people keep walking into his shop and asking him if he's got medical weed all the time. And then he says, like, oh, these drug addicts. And I'm like, buddy, you have to drink immortality tea to live. <laughs> Who's the addict now? Yeah. The, oh, have the turns. A physical and dependence for you to sustain life. But it is the stoners you have a problem with? That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. But of course you did because, you know, you were you were personally targeted here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I don't, you know, I don't smoke that often anymore, to be honest with you. Well, depends. But point. Yeah, that, that's a good point, too. But yeah, I mean, the horny levels immediately reach fever pitch in this book. You know, within the first few pages, you're getting like. Uh, please hold. I'm just going to get it's the Morgan. The Morgan yeah. just turns into a naked lady in his shops and then two bumbling stoners walk bumbling in. Bumbling stoner oh. metalheads. Yeah. Walk I in and that. they're like, oh, this a naked girl and like offends her. And then she promises to like murder them later that day, mm -hmm. which like just why? Uh, here, here we go. Here we go. This is the description of the Morrigan. Um, She was not only built like a Victoria's Secret model, but the sun streaming through the windows lit up her smooth, flawless skin, which was white as confectioner's sugar. Why would an Irish goddess look like a Victoria's Secret model? Last Why check, would a 21-year-old druid use a Victoria's Secret model as a point of comparison for beauty yep. when you've lived for millennia and you probably have other things to... Com this is another missed opportunity for a little bit of more immortality depth. Right. That's a great point. I just hate this one this one dimensional idea of beauty. You can only be pale as milk, thin and tall, luxurious, long hair, white, you know, the pale as milk I guess was getting at that, but um it it's just flawless skin. You know, it's like there's so many dimensions to beauty and it's so lame to just see this come up over and over again in every fucking book we read. I hate it. I hate it so uh, I mean, much. And just that every, nearly every woman, every, I would say every woman who appears on the younger side is, of course, sexualized and judged in their appearance. You know, the Morrigan, when she takes her female form, I mean, she is nude. But again, always painting nudity as inherently sexual is a problem. Um, when, interestingly enough, Atticus's nudity as the male protagonist is not, is never painted as sexual when he needs to get naked to do druid stuff like change into animals or like recharge his body that's never sexualized but every time a woman's naked it is sexualized mildly he when he does it in front of mrs mcdonough's house she's like i'm sure she'd appreciate this wait what when he he one of his naked parts is when mm -hmm. he's getting ready to do a ritual on the front lawn of mrs mcdonough's house while a bunch of werewolf lawyers are also doing yard work for her yeah. For some reason, and he hasn't. There's an offhand line about like, "Well, I bet she'd appreciate all this muscled oh, beefcake he, out here." Yeah, he does say that's true. He does talk about that. Okay, well, there's one instance of the werewolves being sexualized. 
Gotta hand it to him. No, no, we don't. I'm not <laughs> handing him anything. For Under this. no circumstances much you actually hand it to him. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, it's just it's just a bummer. Um at least it was balanced with no explicit sex scenes and no underlying romance or love plots or whatever, but like yeah, it's just this every single thing about this book is a white masculine power fantasy. And it's not it's not interesting to me. It's not interesting to me. Nope. I've read it too many times. I've seen it too many times. The only thing I will hand this author is that this was written, presumably, it was published in 2011, so presumably it was written in 2010, maybe even some years before. I think in the last decade, hell, even the last year or two, a lot of people have started to change how they feel about some of the things we've talked about, whether it's how they view women or how they view masculinity, um, you know, or how they view the dominance of white culture in arts. So, you know, I think that I want to hope that maybe as the series went on or maybe the, and the other things that this author has written, that some of these things are changed. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read all of his work, <laughs> but you know, I want to hope that that's the case and that we're just judging this work reading it now which you know comes with i just think comes with some some considerations but in any case uh when i was talking to i was i was taking notes last night um it's the week of thanksgiving here in america i was taking these notes last night i finished up this book while uh, my boyfriend was doing a bunch of baking and i was just kind of shouting notes at him while he was in the kitchen behind me and he said something that I know Chris and I have said on the show before, but I appreciate that he said this. And he said, we should always ask more from art and entertainment. And it's peculiar when authors or artists don't ask more from themselves or others in that same regard. So again, we're just here to ask a little more from people and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, at least I don't think. We could all always be doing better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always asking more from myself and what I do and the art that I produce. And yeah, so does Chris. Like, um, so I guess, I guess the point of all this is I'm saying there were redeeming qualities to this book. There were a lot of things we didn't like, but ultimately, you know, uh, I guess I just like to reassert this on every so, so many episodes, but we're not here to tear things down or demonize people or, or make anyone feel bad. I think it's, we're here to have fun and make some valid criticisms about things. And I, and that's okay. You know? Um, and it's not in, it's not, um, done with any malice. It's yeah. You know, so. please feel welcome to criticize my work that you can find in quite a bit of places. Out I mean, there. I think, I think, you know, we, we take pains to make it. Check out the new urine EP over on Bandcamp. <laughs> Actually do. It's very good. Um, yeah. so, urine.bandcamp.com. <laughs> That's yearn, Y-E-A-R. For just the low, low price of... Uh, I think it's four bucks right now. Four, four American dollars. You too can be the owner of You can of also the... check out Graveborn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, fuck, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, right. So it, so in summary, this is, the, this is the can we fix it section what would we do to make this book better um, in brief? So, Chris, why don't you why don't you go ahead with yours? I don't know, man. I really think you just got to kind of go back to the drawing board on this one. At least give me deeper druid stuff and lore instead of I just cast the spell. I would have liked to have seen an even deeper connection into what goes into casting those spells. It was just some tattoo stuff. Like, you know, maybe this piece of that tattoo I got when I did this. You know, I, I inscribed myself with this kind of branch or something like that. Or even just more depth into, like, the... I did not like that every situation was cast invisibility on something and hope someone doesn't trip over it. That was most of the tension in any of the scenes in this book. I don't know, depower him a little bit, maybe? Yeah, I th- for sure. I think maybe the very basic bones of the plot of, you know, Angus Og is after this guy because he stole the sword... And he has to ally himself with various deities and other magical forces could have worked in some fashion. But I think oh, you need to rip out a whole lot of this by many branches. Maybe leave some of the root and stem. Yeah. But... yeah. 
that's really all I have. I mean, it's it's yeah. like we said before, it's it's too much of the basic white male power fantasy that we've seen quite a bit of. So I uh, I'm all right. Yeah. I don't need Irish anime. Yeah. Um. So for me, there are no believable consequences in the story for any of the main characters. Um, the main character is just the picture of luck and wields incredible magic. Um, death seems to be, if not reversible, a negotiable state rather than a final one. And, and as I found it very difficult to identify with him for, for those reasons and for some of the other things I mentioned, the kind of nod to some misogynistic leanings, although admittedly not nearly as bad as a lot of things we've read. Um, and, and just, yeah, the, the need to sexualize everything and... It, it was very hard for me to like this character, which is a problem in a book where you're supposed to like the main character, identify with them. Um, and I don't think there's any argument that this is one of those books. He needs, the character needs a more empathetic update. Um, I, I just can't do another hero's journey about a white magical guy. It's just, it's just boring for me. Um, especially when he claims to have lived all over the world and has existed for 2,100 years, but ha seemingly hasn't developed beyond a, 20 to 30 year old dude in the u.s in a lot of ways like at least it's he's written right it doesn't feel like a 2100 no. year old it does druid, not worldly druid um yeah i sorry i already said this goddesses women don't all need to be sexualized all the time elder women especially women deserve desire and we never see that in books and here we had the opportunity to and didn't um you know, at and finally, like, at least keep your internal logic consistent. There were several big old pits to fall into here that could have been avoided with more careful definitions or reasoning. So, for example, like I said earlier, saying, rather than saying druids can only get power from soil, maybe it should have been druids can only get power from loam or silt or, or wet soils and not sand because it's too dry or something, at least something. Um, yeah, I mean... I don't know. There, there was also, I'm going to mention this real quick. Right at the very end, there is this discussion between, there's a truce discussion. They're, they're discussing the terms of a truce between Atticus and the honest cohort of Polish witches who kind of helped him in the end, even though they still have an uneasy relationship. And he's like, well, what if you just leave Arizona forever? And they're like, no, nah, we like it here. And he's like, well, I do too. And they're like, plus, I think you'll find us being here is good because we keep out the undesirables. And then they go on to like list brujas and voodoo priests. And I was getting a little worried because there's a white Polish witch going, we keep out the undesirables. And then starts listing brown <laughs> magic users. And I was like, oh no, oh God, oh no, this is a bad note to end on. <laughs> um, and then, but then they also mentioned the Bacchanal, Bacchanots or something, which are worshippers of Bacchus. And I guess which are considered white, but Greeks weren't really as white as we think of them anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it came off a little, <laughs> a little dog whistle. Yeah, just a little touch there. Just a, just a, <laughs> so a little, <laughs> it was a little scary. Again, I don't, you know, this was written in 2010, 2009, probably. I'm not accusing the author of being racist. I just think that just put a little more care into that list and what calling them undesirables and then listing a bunch of brown magic users. Is maybe not. Sure. Great. You know, brown I get that. Maybe it was just like, we're keeping out any, like maybe yeah. even also put in a line about how like other witch factions aren't allowed in here either. It's just our coven that gets to have this space. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, there was a, an Indian witch in here who was helpful and powerful and instrumental to the plot. Though she was, at first, evil. She's, like, reformed evil. Uh, but, yeah, any, anyway, there was just... It was just an unfortunate placement in the story. Yes. That's, like, how it ends. And I was like, ooh, that's a weird note to end on. Yeah. I think that just could be fixed by just a reworking of that, that section. Different words, different listing of characters there. Um, I did appreciate getting to try to pronounce more Polish stuff in practice here by pronouncing all the Polish witch names oh, yeah, and was... the place they were from, which I'm sure you just like mentally went over in your head. It's like, it's that word. And it's, didn't the bother. K word. it's the K city is what my brain did. Ksiepice, actually. Ksiepice? Ksiepice. Ksiepice? Ksiepice. Ksiepice? No, Pat, mm, how do you not you the the K and then the sh and then a Wait, okay, okay. It's, so it's not a sh. It's a. 
it's somewhere in between there. Je picha. Je picha. No, you're not doing the je enough. It's je. Je There, okay, that's close je enough. Picha. Oh god, but I it's would not. But you're putting a, like a G in front of it instead of the K. <laughs> Je picha. Je picha. No. K R Z. <laughs> there. Okay. Je picha. Okay, that's good. there. You go. Oh. I'm acceptable. I'm released from my Polish bonds. <laughs> but then I'm sure. Did you do that for like the listing of Polish witch names here? Oh yeah. As well? I just. I was like, oh, there's W's next to Z's. I'm leaving this for Chris. Link. I can just give this. The, so the Polish witches are. Radomilia, Emilia, Malina, Jadwiga, Ludmila, Miroslava, Zitslava, Bogmila, Berta, Kazmira, Claudia, Roxana, and Wotslava. In case you needed to know all the Polish witch names. So at least there's some, like, those are legitimately Polish names, I would say. So there's yeah. a little bit of research done here into making sure, like, regionally the names make sense. Yeah, I agree. Um... I don't know. Anyway, there you go. That's how we felt about this book. Oh, thank you to uh, our patron, Lucek J again, uh, for recommending this to us. I hope we you hope... enjoyed me trying to get Paris to say Kshapitsha. <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed that we were able to squeeze this in as the last episode of season five um, before we launch into season six in January. So, yeah, I hope this was a good time for everyone. Uh, it was... Yeah, it was, I think it was a constructive read, constructive episode. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, if there's no further ado, I think I'm going to thank these patrons, talk a little bit about our, our social medias, and then we can, uh, I'm going to go cook some more stuff. All right, well, thank you, patrons, for a wonderful year and a wonderful season five of the Terrible Book Club. Thank you to Dari, Greg, Will, Veronica, D, Lynn, Sinya, Yakub, Bobby Blackcat, Jensina, Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchek J again, and CTAP1. Thank you all very much for supporting the show this year and in previous years. If you also want to help the support... <laughs> if you also want to help support the show, um, and if you want to force us to read a book, you can head over to Patreon and choose the tier that forces us to read a book, or you can choose a lower tier, which gives you access to our content, or an even lower tier just forces us to read your name on the show and um, comes with some of our gratitude. Otherwise, you can subscribe and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Goodreads. You can share the show and tell some people about it, which I would appreciate. We would appreciate. It's a giving time of year. Give the gift of TBC, which costs nothing. Uh, you can also rate or review us on uh, whatever platform, plat platform, plot, plat, 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 whatever podcast platform. Uh, podcast platform. My mouth is not working. Podcast platform of your choice, such as iTunes, Podbean, Podchaser, or whatever. Uh, if you want to contact us directly, you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. You can send us a tweet. You can send us a message on Goodreads or Facebook or Instagram. Those are all the ways. I guess you could... Um... Oh, we didn't talk about the telepathic communication in this book. Oh, yeah. There's, tele there's telepathic communication. Whoops. That's how Atticus talks to Oberon. Yeah. Druid mind stuff. Don't Druid worry about stuff. it. Forgot about it entirely. Not important. Anyway, I think I think we're done. Uh, unless there's something I'm forgetting. We, nope. uh, you are not getting a break from TBC. You're still gonna hear us in two weeks. But Chris and I are taking a break, and it's gonna be wonderful. So we're very look very much looking forward to that. It is the week of Thanksgiving, and I am looking forward to all the cooking and eating, all the delicious eating that I will be doing. So Me I hope, too. I know this is well past Thanksgiving when this comes out, but um, it's winter holiday time. So I hope y'all are having or will shortly have a lovely winter holiday meal of whatever kind. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I, guess I would like to report that as of this recording, I have still successfully avoided hearing Paul McCartney's having a wonderful Christmas time this year. Definitely oh easier this year than Me before. Me too. Oh, we've both survived <laughs> the McCartney. I don't oh. like hearing that song. No, it's the worst. It's the worst Christmas song. I hate that fucking keyboard sound. It's either it's that and Mariah Carey's "All I Want for Christmas Is You." Those are the two that I'm like, I just. Can't At least hang. that one has like some good notes in it. True. I I loathe simply having a wonderful Christmas time because yeah. of that keyboard sound. 
it i loathe it for a variety of reasons but this is a terrible song club so maybe yeah. one day it will be who knows sure for now we're still the share of book club we're still eternally grateful for our listeners and patrons and uh we wish you a wonderful winter holiday season we'll see you in january bye paris bye chris bye